Uh, Lord, thank you for your words, and Lord, it's uh, certainly an honor and privilege to be able to open up a book that is without error, and unfortunately, a lot of the scholars don't think so, but I know it's true, and I do pray you'd help us to understand the words that's written and help us to rejoice in the fact that you've given us these gifts freely, that we might uh, enjoy your gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Romans 8. Well, I used this same outline a uh, couple, two, three months ago, about three months ago, but going to go a little different direction. So if you hear the same outline, don't get up and walk out because you think you heard the same thing. So, But uh, in Romans 8, there's a statement there uh, in both places. We got an amazing statement by the Lord. And Paul says in Romans 8, verse, oh, let's see, th- pick it up about verse 31, where he says this, um, What shall we then say to these things? And, of course, he's referring to everything written before it. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also Freely give us all things. Okay, freely give. That seems redundant. It seems repetitive. Why would he say that? There's a reason for that. That'd be like saying wet water. So he says, freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died rather than that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded that... Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, great promise. Okay, now if you would try 1 Corinthians 2. Pick it up about verse 9. Uh, Both of these passages mention an idea, uh, and he calls it freely given. Freely given. And it seems like it's unnecessarily repetitive, but God is emphasizing something. He's emphasizing a truth to us. 1 Corinthians 2.9 But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So after we receive these gifts freely by God, we go to the Bible and research and study it, and then we realize, oh, this is what's been given to me, and it's been given to me freely. Okay, the idea there, often people tend to think that when you give a gift, the assumption is it's a free gift. But you know, most people, or a lot of people, when they give a gift, okay, be it to a church or to an individual, When you take the gift and raise it up in the air, you'll see these strings dangling from it. Okay, and you got to take a scissors and cut the strings. Because a gift that has strings attached is not a gift. It's a bribe or it's a way to try to manipulate. Now, when God gives these gifts out, uh, he doesn't have strings attached. That's why... He makes sure that we see it. It's freely given. The gift actually can be thrown back in God's face against them. 
because that's why it's a gift. Why does God do something like that? It's because God wants voluntary fellowship. That's what he's looking for. That's what we're looking for, right? We're looking for voluntary friendship. God is looking for voluntary friendship, and his way of discovering voluntary friendship is he gives gifts, but then all the strings are cut, and they're freely given. This is God's method. Now, back in December is where I used this outline, and it was God the Father gives life, God the Son gives eternal life, and God the Spirit gives abundant life. Now, I'm not going to be specific on that because the Godhead works interchangeably. Okay, but the first idea is about this idea about God giving life. Now, that gift of life can be thrown back in God's face, back into the giver's face. Now, when, when that happens to us, we, we get to feel like, what was the use of it? But God don't feel that way. He don't feel that. He has a plan. He's looking for voluntary friendship. In Luke chapter 16, there are ten lepers. And uh, they came across Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ healed them. He said, go back to the priest and show yourself. And when those ten guys took off, one of them, before he got to the priest, stopped, thought of, did I, did I say thank you? I don't think I did. He turned around and went back and found Jesus Christ, and he said, I want to say, I want to ask, I'm going to tell you thank you, and I want to give glory to God. And Jesus' response was, wasn't there ten of you? Well, why'd only one come back? He, that, why? Because generally speaking, that's about, the, that's about the proportion of people that come back to God and say thank you for the gift. About a tenth. And then it goes further on that. Now, God the Father freely gives life. Back in Genesis chapter 2, when you remember that idea where God told Adam, he said, you could eat of the trees of the garden freely. Now, when Eve mentioned that verse, <clears throat> either Adam didn't tell her about the word freely, she overlooked the word freely, I don't know what was going on, but she took the word freely out in her conversation with the serpent, and Eve was the first person deceived. And one of the things that happened when she was deceived is she took the word freely. The f word freely was removed. That's the first word in the Bible that's removed. Freely. Now, when you get to the back of the Bible, when God goes with his original plan, okay, where originally uh, Adam wasn't supposed to sin. They're supposed to live in fellowship throughout eternity. But... So the next time around, he makes a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Guess what word he brings up again? Revelation 21, 6. God has perfect recall. Okay, Revelation 21, 6 is said, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. That's the first word removed by somebody that got deceived. Now, he brings it up a second time in chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 17. He says this, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. There's that word again. That's the first word in the front of your Bible, taken away. person gets deceived. And it's the word God mentions in the back of the Bible when he creates a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Something about that. That word freely. Okay, and if you read the uh, original document that began in this country, it's called the Declaration of Independence. And in there, everybody skips the first paragraph. Don't know why they do, but they skip the first paragraph and they jump right into the second paragraph. And it says in there, all men are created equal. Now, technically, that's not true. It's not true. Some people are born in a rich family, some in a poor family. Okay, the idea. But if you limit to the three ideas they were referring to, is every man is endued with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, the pursuit of happiness, if you go back and read some of those documents, the Federalist Papers or the Anti-Federalist Papers, that's the better ones, 
If you read those documents, when they meant pursuit of happiness, they were referring to the private ownership of property. Now, Thomas Jefferson, when he was getting ready to write, and they were going to write private ownership of property or land. They could be really be alliterated, life, liberty, and land. Okay, but uh, evidently he didn't want to go with the alliteration. Ben Franklin suggested we should go with pursuit of happiness. And their mindset was that is you have a right to your person. You have a right to your property. Okay, and that's what they're referring to, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The first thing they referred to is life. Now, life is freely given by God the Father. God the Father freely gives life. When that baby, you know, is born, that life that's given to that baby, okay, God is the author of that. Now, a person can take that life that God has given to them freely, and they could throw it right back in God's face. And that's what man's doing. You say, how many? What percentage? Well, at least nine out of ten are throwing it right back in God's face. Okay, now, personally, my first recollection of life in itself was about five years old. Now, some folks tell me they remember some things at three, four. Not me. It was five. And it was in the kindergarten at Rangeline Presbyterian Church. Back in those days, they wanted to separate church and state. And so kindergarten was held at the Rangeline Presbyterian Church. It was just a little country church, not even a half a mile from our house. And my first recollection of life was sitting in a corner because the little boy was too much energy, and so that's where the teacher put me, in the corner. And I remember a little, another boy in class got put in that corner. He's in the corner crying, and I thought to myself, what a big sissy. He turned out to be a sissy later in life. Uh, but... <laughs> That's my first recollection of life at five years old, okay? And so at birth, at birth, when we're given life, it's either a boy or a girl. I mean, they look about two or three inches below the navel and they figured it out. There's nothing hard about that. But in Isaiah 45, verse 9, Isaiah, or God says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. And as we get closer to Christ's coming, this is going to increase exponentially where man is striving with their maker. That's the whole mindset of this transgender movement. It's, and again, the kids, they don't know any better. Some perverted mind of an adult is striving with God Almighty. And the thing is, when people get bitter against an individual, they think when their actions of bitterness harms that individual. In some of our cases, it kind of does. But in God's, cases, in God's case, he is not fretting about this at all. Nothing about this. God's saying, I gave you life. If you want to do it with him, what, you want to pretend to be a boy or when you're a girl, you go ahead and pretend. It's vain imagination. God in heaven, don't worry about it. Now, California is the first state now that has a uh, gender-neutral birth certificates. So it's got M, F, and question mark. Confused. Whatever. Okay, in Delaware, back in November, they published uh, Project 220, or Regulation 225. And in this regulation, they publish it in November, a child in the school can identify to what they want to identify, and the last people will know is their parents. So a white boy can come home and say to dad, I'm a black girl. <laughs> and according to Regulation 225, that's how that person will be accepted. Now, that's, that's vain imagination. Somebody is thumbing their nose at God, their maker. And when they thumb their nose at God Almighty, they're going to reap the consequences. Now, God in heaven says in Isaiah 41, verse 23, he says to man, tell me what's going to be hereafter. You shall be God. He said, yea, do good, do evil. See if I'm dismayed. He's not dismayed. He said, ye are of nothing, and the people that chooses you are abomination. God in heaven said, well, no big deal. I gave you life. If you want to use this life to live a, a vain imagination, go ahead and live it. 
That's, a, that's God. That's a free gift. Now, the American College of Pediatricians published back in September some statements about this idea. And they said this, Human sexuality is an objective biological binary trait. XY and XX are genetic markers of male and female, respectively, not genetic markers of a disorder. Then they said this, a person's belief that he or she is something they are not is at best a sign of confused thinking. Now, I'll bet you anything they're going to have to change these statements. Then they said this, and this is a reality of life. The rate of suicide nearly are nearly 20 times greater among adults who use cross-sex hormones and undergo sexual reassignment surgery. Why? Is they're striving with their maker. You are wrong, and I'm going to take my finger, and I'm going to... I'm going to point that up to heaven and say, you are, you are a wicked being and I'm going to do my thing no matter what you think. And God in heaven says, go to it. I'm not dismayed. Now, these people, these pediatricians concluded this statement. Conditioning children into believing a lifetime of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex is normal and healthful is child abuse. Well, I agree with that statement. Totally and absolutely. But this shows us the aspect of God Almighty in that when he gives life, there are no strings attached. When that little boy is born, and that little boy and that little girl, but that little boy, when he gets up about two or three, gets potty trained, and he's got to go potty, and any dad is going to say, there's a tree. And what's that little boy going to do? That little boy is going to drop his drawers all the way to his ankles, is he not? And dad is kind of chuckling about it. And mom may be smiling, but maybe, oh, don't do that. But about, hopefully, about maybe three years later, within three years after that, the conclusion is going to come to his mind. I feel funny when I do this now. He gets to be a little bit more discreet about doing that. Why? His conscience is becoming alert. He's recognizing good from evil. He now is in a position he can consider the Savior. And you know what God's going to offer that little guy? A free gift. Free gift. Redundant. But it's got no strings attached also. Eternal salvation has no strings attached to it. God the Son freely gives eternal life. In Romans chapter 5, verse 15, he says, free gift. He says, gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ. In verse 16, he says, free gift. In verse 17, he says, gift of righteousness. And in 18, he says again, free gift. Why? There's no strings attached to eternal salvation. Just because someone is saved, God is not going to make him fulfill his will. Not going to do it. Now, my gift of salvation <coughs> occurred when I was eight or nine. Came home on that school bus from center school, and I have no idea what led up to it. Not a clue. <coughs> All I know is I ran up two-tenths of a mile up that driveway, ran up to my bedroom, second story of that two-story two, two farmhouse, got beside my bed, got on my knees, and I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I can remember that just like now. And if I tell that to the average person, the average preacher, here's what they're going to do. They're going to say, well, did you repent? I have no idea. Did you cry? I doubt it. I'm not much of a crier. Uh, did you get on your knees? Yeah, I think I did that. Does, that. does that qualify? Oh, do I have to get on my knees to get saved? Did you uh, pray the sinner's prayer? What's that? Did you speak in tongues? I don't know if I talked to anybody. Were you baptized? Well, I got baptized three times. In the Dutch Corner Church, 
I got sprinkled. I don't remember it. Got sprinkled. And then I got baptized in a Bible church, in a community Bible in Demont. But when I went to Colorado and I was getting ordained, the preacher saw I got baptized in a Bible church, and he's a, he was a brighter. And he said, you got to get baptized in a Baptist church. So I got a bath again. What? Strings. Strings attached. Some would say, well, did you confess? Mm, confess what? Eight or nine raising a farm? What am I going to confess? I did shoot them pigs a couple times with a BB gun, and I watched her tail go, rear, 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 and I thought that was kind of funny. So maybe I had to confess to that pig. I don't know. Uh, well, I think you were too young. you got to be 12. That's a new thing that's coming around now. you got to be 12 in order to get saved. I don't know about that. I think Jesus said, except to be converted as a little child. He said little child. If he would have said child, that would have been about 9, 10, 11, 12. But he said little child. Besides, I was around eight or nine, something like that. person says, well, did you walk an aisle? An aisle in a Dutch Reformed church? They don't even do that. I mean, Dutch Corner down there in DeMott? No way. Uh, well, did you admit you were a sinner? I just knew that. Well, did you fear going to hell? I didn't even know if there was a hell. You know, a, lot of, a lot of soul winning methods is you scare the guy about hell and then you're the great big hero receiving, you know, taking somebody out of hell. I tell you, when the Lord Jesus Christ commands a man to go to hell, God is right in what he does. Okay, well, another person will say, well, <clears throat> do you know the date you were born or born again? I don't know the date I was born the first time. I was so little. I mean, the only way I know anything is somebody who claimed to be my parents told me. I'd have to do all the DNA studies to find that out. Uh, well, did somebody give you the Romans Road? I didn't know anything about a Romans Road or a, a Filipino Road. Well, did you have the wordless book? What is that? I didn't discover that until several years later. Well, do you have works meet for repentance? What works? Did you display any fruits? Well, at my, my mind at that time, a fruit, I didn't want anything to do with a fruit. Had a different viewpoint on that. Well, did you get the Holy Ghost? Well, I found out later I got him. I didn't know at the time. What did you ask Jesus into your heart? Not a clue. I don't know about that. Have you ever doubted it? Well, I doubted myself several times. But I've never doubted Jesus Christ to be the Savior. You know, these folks, they're not trying to... What they're trying to do is they're trying to convince themselves I got saved. It's none of your business, pal. If you want to believe I'm saved, fine. If you don't, I don't care. I know what's going on in my heart. I know my God read my heart at that moment, and there's a little boy, a sincere boy, that came to Jesus Christ. I mean, he heard enough in a Dutch corner church, and thank God I was predestinated not to be a Calvinist even though I was born into it. But you know, the, the, the glorious thing about God and His words is that He can use His words through any means. And now, years later, years later, I discovered I got born again at that time. I didn't know about born again at that time. And Jesus said, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then He said, except you be born of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the conclusion was, when I got born again, that guaranteed me of seeing and entering the kingdom of God. Man, that's a good deal. I didn't know that at the time. All I knew is that I trusted Jesus Christ. Nobody told me to. I don't know what led up to it. And nobody gave me assurance afterwards. After I got done trusting in Jesus Christ, I probably went outside, took a baseball, and threw it against the barn roof, just like I always did. Played the Cubs and the Cardinals, and the Cardinals always won, because I liked the Cardinals then. Okay? Uh, and that's salvation. But so many churches have strings attached. Do you know why? Manipulation and control. That's the reason why. They want to control people to keep them in this little box. 
And that way they can keep them coming as long as they got them in this box. And they forget in John 3, 8, Jesus Christ said, people who are born of the Spirit are like the wind. And there's no strings attached. Now, a person should take the gift that God's given them and try to bless God with it. But how many do? Probably less than one out of ten, just like the lepers. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says that God will have all men to be saved. Who will have all men to be saved. Now, a lot of times, people are satisfied with that. And, you know, they can be satisfied with that if that's their choice. But then the verse keeps going. Who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. There's other gifts that God offers, other gifts, and they are freely given with no strings attached. Okay, and this is where God the Spirit steps in, who I didn't know God the Holy Ghost at that time. I didn't even know anything about that. I didn't know the Spirit of God came in my body when I trusted Jesus Christ. I didn't know a lot of things that took place. But then as you grow in grace, you look back on it and say, wow, what a blessing. And nobody can take that away from you. And that's why, you know, actually, you know, when a person remembers that moment they got saved, you got to remember that you were the one trusting Jesus Christ, not somebody told you you trusted Jesus Christ. And that's as parents is so difficult for us. Because we want our kids to get saved as early as possible in life. And I could have, we could have had our kids pray in a prayer at three. You know, but the thing is, is you just give them the gospel and then let it go. And when they come to the realization of their need of Christ, when they come to you after you've sown the seed on multiple occasions, then it becomes theirs personal. That's very important. Okay, and God the Spirit, here's what He has done. If you would look in Romans chapter 6. God the Spirit gives or is instrumental in the abundant life. And He gives every born-again believer everything that is needed to live a new life. That's been given. But there's no strings attached to it. Romans chapter 6 verse... um, Four it says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, <clears throat> that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also <clears throat> will, no, should, should walk in newness of life. And if folks that got these strings attached will say, see, I told you they weren't saved because they don't have any fruit. Well, you're probably a fruit. I mean, I mean, who knows the fruit? You can go to our farm and see kernels of corn in a grain bin. And that corn has no fruit. The only way it's going to have fruit is when that corn is placed in the ground and takes some moisture and it dies to itself, and then a body is created. Now, in that kernel, every kernel, there is energy, there's life there. But depending on the seed, man, some seeds sprout in three or four days. I think a sequoia seed is going to take forever. Okay, but the thing, idea, there's life in there. So God the Spirit is the one that helps us to live as we should walk in newness of life. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. doesn't say we will. Why? Because that gift that's given a moment of faith in Christ, there are no strings attached to it. God has given every believer the ability to live in pleasing to him. Every believer, but there's no strings attached to that. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, 
A person might say, well, why, why, don't these, why don't some of these folks access it? That's the reason why we don't do a lot of things that we know we should do. We forget. We get in a rut. We just don't think it's available. Uh, I can guarantee that every one of us are dehydrated in some fashion. And most problems that we have physically is we don't drink enough water. But we all do that. Why don't we do that? It's so easy. Is it not so easy? Just click, 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 click. But we don't do it. And water is symbolism of the Bible. And is it not true that most of us don't read the Bible like we should? Why don't we? I'm not going to be a Pharisee. You should do it. Well, I do the same thing everybody else does. Now, the gift is there, and, and it's available to us. Colossians 1.9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled, might, might be filled, with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Every born again believer has been given the ability to please God. It's, it's given by God upon faith in Christ. None of us knew that that was given to us at the moment we got born again. It's there. And in Galatians 5, he says that about this liberty that we've been given in Galatians 5, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, in Galatians, the yoke of bondage was Judaism. But in America, each church is in a little different faction, whatever the yoke of bondage is. He has said we have been declared free. Free from what? In Romans 6, 7, and 8, free from sin. We're free from it. But why do so many believers go back to it? We just do. Okay, but we're free from that. And he says in chapter 5, verse 5 of Galatians, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness, which is by faith. Just in salvation is, is, is free in Jesus Christ upon faith in Christ. That's justification. Sanctification works in the same manner. It's only our faith is in the Spirit of God asking Him to work it through us. And then the Spirit is given access to work through us. Not only that, but the Spirit will take the words of God to give us strength to live in pleasing to God. That's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, where he says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Free course. What does that mean, free course? That's a term in admiralty law. That's when you're sailing on the ocean. And, and you have no motors or anything, and you've got to put the sail out, and you have a wind that's favorably going toward the direction that you'd like to go. And the free course in the Bible is when the Spirit of God takes the words of God and pushes you toward Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit that does it. And your life begins to slowly change in pleasing to Him. Sure, people have all these rules and regulations, and if you do this, you're okay. Maybe you are, but maybe you're not. God is the one reading that heart. It's faith in what God said. Belief in the Spirit and in the Scriptures will build you up. But that's why we got to get in a book personally. You people say, well, I read my Bible every day. Yeah, but does it read you? There's a difference. Do you, when you read that book, do you say, oh, wow, Lord, I believe that. Lord, I've, this, you know me, Lord, I'm weak here and I'm weak there. And the Lord says, okay, let's go to my book and find some verses. Memorize those verses on your weak areas. Get that memorized. Get it in your heart now. 
and we'll strengthen those weak areas and let the Spirit work. Most people, when they look at sermons or they think, they think, oh, so-and-so could use this one. How about, I need this one. I have a hard enough time keeping myself straight, let alone everybody else. And when we go to the Spirit and the Scriptures and that builds us up, then God is offering an inheritance in the millennial time period. Because of justification, a person is guaranteed to see it and enter it. But to be a participant in it, that is conditioned upon letting the Spirit work through us. If you would, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This word of Spirit builds us in grace. 2 Corinthians 5, he says this, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Promise. Boy, looking forward to that. For in this we groan. Yeah, we do. Especially when you see the world going into the directions it's going. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. That's the gift. It's freely given. We can grieve the Spirit of God. We can resist Him. We can quench Him. It's freely given. No strings attached. But He's ready, readily available. If you would, one more place. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Okay, Romans 5, verse 1, <clears throat> verse probably memorized. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's justification. But the verse doesn't stop because the Lord wants us to continue and He has more gifts that's been given to us. Okay, so we're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom all... Also, we have access by faith into this grace. That's a daily dispensing of grace. That is the ability to stop doing things that offend God and start doing things that pleases God. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So what do we do? We ask for that. We ask for the grace of God to believe and obey His words. And that access is readily available. It's a free gift given. We should <clears throat> walk in newness of life. But if a believer doesn't walk in newness of life, we're not going to rip his salvation away from him because God's not going to take it away from him. But we do try to encourage and exhort one another to live in newness of life. How do we do that? Am I going to, you know, you're going to call me up and everything? And yeah, there's times we have accountability with people, but how about accountability with the Spirit? I mean, He's with us every moment of every day. We go to the Spirit of God and say, I can't do this. You've got to give me grace. And then He funnels the grace to us. And then you say, wow, I didn't think I could do that. We can't do it in the flesh. It's the Spirit that has to do it. And so the same thing, God the Spirit freely gives the gifts that are available for us to live the abundant life. And then when we follow that path, the Lord Almighty has, oh, I'm going to give you an inheritance in a millennial time period. Isn't that a good deal? I don't know about you, but I think that's a good deal. This is how God <coughs> discovers who voluntarily want to serve him, not peer pressure. I know there could be good and bad peer pressure. But when a person succumbs to good or bad peer pressure, they're just succumbing to the pressure. 
God wants us to voluntarily walk with him because we love him. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help each and every one. Lord, a lot of times we hear so much that we're unsure of salvation. People sit here. and Lord, I pray that their salvation experience would be personal, that they would trust Jesus Christ. And all these strings that people throw in there, just clip them off. Take that sharp two-edged sword and cut them off because it's faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to, to be like that one leper that came back to you and gave you glory and appreciated the gift that you've given, the gift of life, the gift of eternal life, the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the abundant life. Help us to walk with you personally, love you more, and by chance, if somebody is not saved, that they would place their faith in Christ. They can do that any moment of any day and be assured of their salvation. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Okay, we'll be dismissed with that.